I'm Charlotte Devonport. I'm here in Woodstock, Vermont at 509 Prosper Road Sculpture Fest. This is Sculpture Fest 2019. We have annual shows and we always have two featured artists, a man and a woman, and in this case, 28 other people here on the land. This year we have three exhibitions. This is the original place. This land is an adventure for a long time. If you could come walk around, bring your picnic, children, dogs can come too if they're on a leash. And it's a wonderful place to be. It's a very hot day as I'm speaking to you, and the breezes on the plateau are wonderful. It's, it's a nice escape. It's the best show I think we've had in all these years and I've never said that. I believe somehow it just came together perfectly. Our two uh, featured artists, one a very new artist, one an artist who's been working as an artist for a long time, and they already know each other, they're um, collaborating in certain ways, and it's, it's amazing to see the culture grow, not just this show. And downtown in the village at the History Center, there's a show called Carvers and Sculptors. It was in honor of the fact that the series was carved by Chris Miller and Jerry Williams and put on top of the state, state, state house this year. And so that work reflects carving and in wood and stone and marble and history inside the uh, History Center with Hiram Powers and some other works that are part of our history here in Vermont. And on August 24th, Jay Mead, the curator, is going to be opening the show at the King Farm, which is a Vermont Land Trust property, and a wonderful place. People have been walking there. We've been walking there for 56 years, but they are now walking there and seeing installations on the land and enjoying the work. Experimental pieces, basically. Uh, things that only belong there right now uh, to learn from again. Here with Stefania Urist, uh, an artist that's going to be with us this year at Sculpture Fest. I'm very interested in this new piece with this incredible ceiling made out of glass forms and I'd like you to tell us how you did that. Um, so my piece, the ceiling, is a glass ceiling sculpture. Uh, it is a gazebo-like structure um, or folly structure that is made with glass tiles that are reminiscent of terracotta roofing tiles, but connected in a way that make it not watertight or weather resistant. So I'm interested in um, making architecture and nature interact more rather than trying to separate the two and having architecture function as a barrier for humans between nature and themselves. So there are strategic gaps in between all of the glass so that water and rain and snow and wind will all move through the piece seamlessly. Um, and politically, a glass ceiling um, is there, but there's also all the gaps in it, so it is permeable. So I'm interested in the concept of a, gla of a glass ceiling and how it fits into our cultural history, but it isn't, um, it doesn't need to be broken. It is permeable currently, but it is still there. So um, it's a little, it, it's more, more of an evolving idea rather than a rigid one. And um, the shape, the rounded shape of it, I also see as a birth canal and the open top in the middle, um, I think of as a birth canal for nature and architecture to one is creating the other and it's kind of a symbiotic relationship of, um, humans, nature, and architecture all growing and 
constructing together. So I know very little about you. I know you were at, at Rhode Island School of Design, and I've had a lot of nice artists from MISD. Uh, what brought you here, and why did you major in um, this kind of constructive sculpture? And it's quite a big step. Yeah, it was a big departure for me. Um, I grew up in Connecticut. Um, then I went to RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, I was actually in the glass department, oh. um, which at RISD is much more of a conceptual sculpture department. It's um, with a focus on glass, but it's um, it's less a technique-based and more um, idea-based mm -hmm. program. So um, I went in actually as an illustration major because I loved painting. Mm -hmm. And I had, my first year I had a teacher who um, gave very open-ended prompts and I started making three-dimensional work and um, it just really opened my eyes to what art could be mm -hmm. um, and that it's more about the ideas and the concept of the work um, and the materiality versus um, just what you see. Mm -hmm. um, so I started working three-dimensionally and then um, the glass department really pushed pushed my ideas and my thinking really hard at school and so that's really what led me to be a sculptor. Um, then I moved to New York after school and um, I love New York, I loved the hustle and bustle but um, Vermont is a great place to make work. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more open space, um, a lot more time to breathe and think so um, I was going to come here just for a short period of time and I figured out that it was just a fantastic place to make work so here um, so here I am yeah now I have a husband and a baby and a great and a house and so and we're it's, all glad she's here yeah. <laughs> and you have to travel and a little bit it. but that's okay yep. um, it's a it's a great home base here Stefania has been in last year's show would you tell us a little bit about I figured the process I met you at Ava Gallery yeah we met a couple years ago at the Ava Gallery I had a piece there um, that won an award and then we started talking about this location and um, Sculpture Fest and you invited me to be an artist here last year. So I created um, a piece called Our House that is out of brick and mortar and asphalt shingles. Mm -hmm. And then you asked me to be, uh, I got the honor of being the featured artist this year. Um, and I created a piece that is made out of glass and wood and that is a glass ceiling. And it is mm -hmm. called the ceiling. And both of these uh, sculptural forms are site specific and beautifully sited actually. And what intrigues me is at your young age, working in large, large pieces and having a new little baby in her life and bringing this beautiful child here while she's working and a helpful husband. And I want to um, ask you this. Does this express something very specific about this time and place for you, where you're living in Vermont? And describe what it means to you. Absolutely, yeah. I work uh, a lot with architecture as a theme in my work, um, mm -hmm. houses and building and construction materials, um, literally and as a metaphor um, for life and growth and construction, um, because I'm really interested in the uh, categorization of architecture and nature and femininity and masculinity and I really like blending all of those different ideas together instead of separating them. Um, I like melding melding them together. Mm -hmm. So um, all of these kind of house themes are definitely thematic in my work and um, my new baby as you mentioned um, inspires me and being a new mom inspires me and um, thinking about my role as a woman and as a mother and as an artist and career woman um, all those things they definitely have to do with my work. So I like glass um, as a material because it is ephemeral. Um, the pieces have an iridescent quality to them so when you look through them you can see a slight color change and um, it always changes based on the lighting and the direction of the light and the light flowing through it but then so it's a barrier but you can move through it as well it's all of these things at once it's um, glass is very brittle and dangerous but also has this um, 
really loving and sensual quality to it. So I like kind of the push and pull of um, the materiality of glass for that reason and that it has all these different um, conflicting but seamless um, natures to them. Um, I shaped each individual piece of glass in a kiln and then I connect them with a leaded glass or stained glass technique that I've modified to uh, work three-dimensionally so that I can work with flat glass but then make it three-dimensional. Create the form, make a mold. Exactly, yep. Right. So I make a, I make a mold for all the glass and then and fire it And this can be done in a regular kiln like I use. Um, uh, Stefania showed me, we walked in and she just said, if you use kiln glass, you can do it too. So I'm kind of hoping to learn how. <laughs> I'm also interested though in the idea that the materials, you made your own bricks for the first one as well. Yes. Tell us about making bricks. I've never met another artist that makes bricks. <laughs> yeah, so I've uh, changed and altered a lot of different techniques in order to make it work for, um, make, make all of the materials really specific to my work. Um, I formed bricks out of clay, um, which bricks usually are made out of clay, but um, not clay you can buy at a ceramic store. So um, I make those, then fire them, and then also shape them, and then I mortar them in a traditional they look way. just that, like a regular yeah. building, mm -hmm. only there are these two young, a young couple leaning over with their arms up, creating a house form. Yeah, it's creating so. the iconic shape of a house. Um, and it's over the shape of my husband and I leaning together. So um, I'm asking, what is a home? What is a house? Is a house, um, is your home the place that you live or is it where your partner is? And the relationship. Exactly, yeah. and you leaning against each other. Um, if one side wasn't there, it would fall apart. Yeah. And um, so it creates that structure because you're together. It's an interesting combination to look at it and study mm -hmm. and have fun with. I also think that the idea that you can tuck in under the one that's down in the field, this mm -hmm. is the one where they, with their arms up, um, and also that roofing is actually on it. It's mm -hmm. actual roofing. Right. We have a lot of artists now working in materials that I relate to work, either uh, wall building, welding, a lot of people welding, working in steel. So the combination of the skill comes from a, a work tradition, particularly in Vermont. I've noticed this a lot, and we'll see that when we walk around, I think, get some pictures. And yours is so specific. And I also would add, I, I learned recently that you moved in this time, and, it, and you're in your own house. Yes, we, right. bought, we bought a house and have been renovating it over the past two years. So that also uh, informs my work, absolutely. So um, there we go, work. And art yep. coming together, just like with the men who build the, the walls and then they create beautiful things like Hector Santos. I love that particular experience in Vermont and as years have gone on, I think it really helps define this region in a good solid way. Sure. Well, I think it's very distinctive work and I'm glad you're here and it, it has a good impact on people around us too. Roger Goldenberg is the featured man artist this year, and he's been in, this, this is the second time he's been featured. He's been part of Sculpture Fest for a long time. He's also been part of the sculpture world in the Upper Valley and down around Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and generally known widely, regionally. And it was time for a new body of work to come here, and we're just thrilled to have you. Well, thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here. It's wonderful. And I was like the man who came to dinner. I, I stayed for at least two weeks. He had the, them together. That's why so. we're all such good friends. 
This can happen at Sculpture Fest. People come and as long as you are here working, it's part of the planet here. We just mm -hmm. all get along, use the same equipment, help each other. And it's been an experience for us because we learn a lot about who our artist friends are and what their ambitions are. And in this case, <coughs> Roger also has done a lot of work at Ava Gallery in the new center there. And so I think if it weren't for Paulette who introduced us and mm -hmm. all of these things, we wouldn't have had you here for that really important program that he's involved in um, and teaching at. Yep. I'd like to know the difference between how these act and how the ones that sometimes get boring to me that just keep going around and around like a windmill. These really do dance. They dance with temperature. I notice in the morning when the light comes, they all of a sudden they start to move. When it's cold in the winter and it's not wind, but the sun hits them and they move mm -hmm. and they don't spin. They have their own dance. Right. Well, that's intentional. I, I designed the, the bases so that there's a slight wobble and it's a very, very simplistic turning device. It's um, based on the old merry-go-rounds that we used to have in the playgrounds where basically there was a post with a rounded end resting on a metal um, plate and um, they would be greased but they would just spin lazily and these like I said have a bit of a wobble I wanted them to mimic how trees move in the wind and um, and dance so they they work they move in a circular motion either direction and dance um, I've always loved kinetic work and I'm always moving forward so So this show actually has a wonderful variety of how these surfaces that are floating in air. When you're really far away and you can't see the base, you almost feel that they've come from another planet and they're dancing around us just in the air. And this variety of color and of white and of this rusted sort of thing. And then I love the idea of the space between these simple lines. It's, it's almost like you're doing a portrait of a certain section of the woods when you look through it, yeah. and a, or a lens, you know? So it's, a lot of it is about all of us being able to see things differently, to look around and to just sort of relish the fact that we live on the land and all of us in Vermont in this region have these views all the time. I'm just looking through the rusted one and thinking, oh, what a beautiful color from the roof mm -hmm. in the opening space. So they're actually living paintings. They're, they're yeah. still kind of paintings, in my mind, that happen to float in the atmosphere now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're, you know, they're, um, you know, I've spent my life out in nature, hiking, and, mm -hmm. you know, so there's also this um, flora aspect, you know, they're, they're mm -hmm. plant-like in a way. Yeah. Stems. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, you know, like like a lot of high school kids or at grade school kids, you know, you pick up an instrument and I played through, you know, the 12 years of, um, right up through high school, but didn't come back to it till years later. Um, uh, I think had I had an encouraging music instructor, I probably would have launched into music, perhaps. Um, but when I went off to college, I did take a lot of art classes and. Uh, veered away from that, majored in geology, veered away from that and became a carpenter. And a Went to Antarctica. Yeah. That's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, I was on two research expeditions to Antarctica when I was a geology student at the University of New Hampshire. Um, so a lot of diversity, you know, I've had a lot of interest and oh, years ago I thought it was kind of a handicap because it was really hard to focus on something. And uh, actually it was my sister Rachel who said, no, nah, that's sort of a gift. It'll play itself out well in your life, you know. Um, I forget what the question was. Well, oh, I've, oh, oh the evolution. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I had been working as a cabinet maker. I did a lot of historical restoration work in the Portsmouth, New Hampshire area. And I came to this point where I realized that if I was going to maintain my interest in wood, I would have to start making wood art with wood. And 
I really had always wanted to paint and draw. So I went back to the University of New Hampshire, got my BFA in two years. Um, not thinking I would go to graduate school, but then circumstances changed and um, I applied and got a full scholarship to the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. And full scholarships your first year out is really unheard of. Um, so I was really fortunate. At first I thought maybe they'd given me a football scholarship or something <laughs> by accident. And, and it turns out they didn't have a football team. Women's <laughs> soccer was huge there. But, oh, was um, it really? Oh, yeah, good yeah. for them. Good yeah, well, it had been a women's art school. It was... Um, oh, really? Yeah. And I so that was that. why that campus in particular had a rich art program. Um, rich in money and in history. And probably specific um, to the space, which always yeah. helps for art. And at the time, I was, you know, I was working in a realist fashion and um, working with a figure. And um, I had this... But because of this idea of feeling of motion and moving forward, my paintings became irregular shaped um, with a lot of expressionism in them. And uh, there was this moment, we had a visiting artist, Ursula von Riedingsvard came oh, to wow. visit. And she was rather dour, all dressed in black. And, um, she walked into my studio and stopped at the door and looked at the paintings and said, you're a sculptor, why are you painting? And I said, no, I'm not. And we had this, yes, you are, no, you aren't argument. And then finally she said, no, really, why aren't you sculpting? And I said, well, I was a carpenter for years and I just got sick and tired of being dirty. And, <laughs> and I said, painting and drawing so much more civilized. <laughs> and she said, oh, you don't have to get dirty if you're a sculptor, which I don't think is true. Um, I can't figure out how anyone would make a sculpture and not, not get be covered grubby. with dust. Yeah. Um, and so I sort of really discounted her. Um, and, you know, I think sculpture was running along behind me <laughs> and reached out and grabbed me at some point. I still was painting and making prints, printmaking. Um, my paintings, though, a lot of my friends were talking amongst themselves and calling them sculptures. I didn't realize that. You know, they had this sculptural sense about them. And, um, and some of them are 3D. Yeah, we yeah, there's a lot of texture, you know. That comes out. But space. anyway, I... I um, some opportunities in Portsmouth arose. Um, a church was having a, a fundraiser and they wanted artists to paint stools. And I thought, oh, that's boring. <laughs> so I painted my stool yellow. I went up on the roof of the button factory, spray painted it yellow, and then I made these stainless steel wands with a dog leg and a oh, pigtail on them. And I had banners dangling, little banners, and th the weight to the rod strength was such that it, the slightest breeze in the house would make them dance. And I, I called it Peacock Chair. And then I, for the church, I changed the title and I called it the, um, something like ins Inspiration Bench or something. And I joked with that if you sat in it, it would make you smarter. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then Portsmouth, I was on the Cultural Commission there for a number of years. And after I was gone, um, well, we created this program called Overnight Art. And the idea was one day there wasn't art in a certain spot and the next day it went up and it would be up for six weeks. Oh, so I, I took that, that idea of the stainless steel rods, which is where you met me yeah. at Ava, and oh, yeah. enlarged them and they were planted. I designed this piece, kinetic piece, for the new public library, site specific. It, it, they um, strung alongside the entry walk. And um, the program was so successful they kept extending it and it was a monsoon summer. We had torrential rains, and I had, of course, I have this affinity for paper, so like with the birch oh. trees, I had watercolor paintings in them, and these, the banners were larger, and they were made of watercolor paper, and I had treated them, so I thought that they'd be waterproof, and um, it became a hobby. Every Saturday night after dark, I'd go down with a flashlight and replace the ones that were starting to <laughs> deteriorate with, with, um, with uh, um, Tyvek painted high-back pieces. Um, so, you know, all along, I'm starting to learn about materials and about scale. Um, and then I think the next piece I made was for here. I was in the paddock down there below at Charlotte's and Peter's, and um, I tried using reed and watercolor paintings and uh, inside the hoops and uh, brought them here. And this is where I learned about scale because they were really diminutive. I called it like crocus pocus or something, but I was really underwhelmed. 
and realized that I had to really think about size of the work. So it's, you know, it's kind of been my own edge. And self materials. My so own no, education. Yeah, and materials. materials tell what these forms <coughs> well, people yeah. will see I mean, later. And well, I abandoned watercolor paper for outdoor use, <laughs> um, as much as I love paper. And uh, the next piece here was the welded steel. I I'd, I'd transformed from the birch trees and paper to um, <coughs> welded steel rod and um, aluminum, painted aluminum. And I talked to Gamblin Paints, and they assured me that they were good for outdoors, and many sign paper painters use the, their paint. Um, and like all of my work, they're improvisations. I didn't really say that. You know, I don't build maquettes, and I don't. The, so I was actually, again, here. I can't remember if I was living here. I'm certain I stayed over a number of times, but I built that in their dry, in Charlotte and Peter's driveway. And, uh, and then just this season, I took it back. It needed a little sprucing up, and I. I adjusted some of the proportions. I wasn't happy with them. So, and then there's a piece down below that you'll see um, that's white. The elements inside the steel are white, and I um, I used uh, polycarbonate. It's Lexan's a brand name, and um, as opposed to I was studying up Lexan versus plexiglass, and Lexan is more durable and less brittle. They use it in motorcycle masks and, and eyeglasses. And I wanted them translucent, and so I, you know, I was able to scuff it up. And uh, the idea, I had made some wire and rice paper pieces, and they reminded me of the money plant, Lunaria something or other. And uh, actually the name of that piece is Lunaria, and I wanted them to have that, um, well, that quality. It's kind of a sublime quality. That, and um, as I was sitting here while Charlotte was talking I was noticing you know the sunlight hits them and they change to a yellow and then their shadows cast from one one element to the next um, and people that know me are wondering why they're you know are you gonna paint them <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I have a I have an understated side as well my, my work tends to be loud including the line drawing yeah there's a one piece out there that's just I call it um fiddlehead line drawing we'll see it later Talk about your teaching a bit. Well, after graduate school, I never really intended to teach, but um, I was lured into it. Um, the University of New Hampshire needed someone to jump in and teach a drawing class. So I told myself that, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't kill me to teach, you know, one class a, a semester. So I did for a few years there. And I come in and out of teaching. I taught at various colleges, um, the last being Norwich University. Um, I taught an improv painting class, um, one of them, and uh, as well as drawing and watercolor. But um, now at Ava, I, actually it was at Ava that started drawing me up to this area. I was teaching printmaking in oh, yeah. like 2007, I think, and um, got to know Ben Torgerson, the former director there, and, um, and then Recently, it was three years ago now, I started part-time in their new sculpture building as the um, building manager. Um, my job was to lay out the floor plan, procure equipment, um, uh, recruit teachers. Um, so I've, I've sort of weaned myself away from teaching because I'm so busy working with the program. But you help design teaching sessions and programs and yes. choose people. Yes. And find yeah. the students, which has a really important part of how artists have an impact, I think, on our region. And you have had, and people who've known you have come here. And this is, it's a kind of community of people that like to work in, you know, hard forms often, welding, which you mm -hmm. do, and in steel and yeah. heavy equipment. It's pretty yeah. remarkable what's going on now. When we started, it was much simpler. And we didn't get work as strong as what the work is now. When you use the word improv, I forgot to say that you're a musician. And you're, this piece right here, not right. far from us, was um, the first one that reflected that in its mm -hmm. title. It was called yeah. Field Notes. Yeah, Field Talk Notes. Talk about the relationship between music and... Field Notes on, ja um, on what do I call my work? It's... Um, Doesn't matter. Oh yeah, Field Notes on Visual Jazz. Yeah, Visual Jazz. Visual oh. Jazz, great yeah. word. Well. 
I think if, the, if things had been different, I might have been a, a professional trumpeter and not um, a visual artist. Um, but um, I was drawn into the visual arts. I always wanted to be an artist of some sort. And uh, later in life, went back, studied, and pursued a career. Um, but there's always been music in me. Um, it's just always going on. And in this case, especially jazz. And um, it has found its way into my work. I think there's always movement in my paintings or, or my prints, uh, movement and music. And, um, and I've been pursuing jazz trumpeting on an amateur level. So I've been working hard at that. I, I would mention there are three uh, artists here this year who, and all three of them are <coughs> musicians playing, I guess, in jazz bands, all, everybody, off and on. And um, Phil Thorne and a new artist named John McKenna. And as a person observing this and not knowing a lot about math and not knowing a lot about jazz, I've been responding to this work with a new understanding or aesthetic that I'm learning from. You could never stop learning. It just goes on and on. And um, I wouldn't have thought 15 years ago I would even ask that question. Uh, people do their work from places when they're in a regional space, no matter how much history they know, no matter how much art they've seen. And you did live in New York for a while. And a lot of the artists here did live in New York. That impact is really important in terms of learning. But, but I see when I look at visual pieces and whether it's painting, whether it's anything, that Vermont had a certain um, individuality. People that have to go it alone in a way for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And it allows them to go yeah. into who they are in their work. So they're not, you know, copying other people or too influenced. Well, and speaking to the, you know, the bar being raised every year, the work being, you know, improving. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's sort of a learning lab that way because we do get to meet regional artists. Um, you know, we scrutinize each other's work and we share ideas. And, you know, if you see something that's coming in that's, you know, lifted to another level, that I think inspires everybody also to pay more attention to certain details, push themselves a little more. Um, and then there's some of us who just do that all the time. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's been interesting to see, you know, And the mixing grow. of materials. Yeah. You could, if you come here, you'll see some general <coughs> kinds of phenomena. For example, stone is done and lot here. And you'll see other people now adding stone into the, how they show their work or, mm -hmm. or wood that uh, Herb Ferris has been working with people in the lumber world for a long time taking on trees that they call sweep trees. Other people are now starting to use wood. Uh, Jay Mead, for example, on the barn. You see a relationship of the region as you walk around of artists, and that reflects all our lives. This isn't just artists. Mm -hmm. We all live here, so we kind of get it, I think. Don't you? Yeah, I do. I do. A very elderly professor was called back in to teach um, my Tri our tribe of graduate students uh, at the University of North Carolina, and he had said, um, artists are the laziest people on the planet. <laughs> and I, you know, me, I took offense at first, and then over the years, you know, I've contemplated on that a lot. And there's a lot of downtime. And I know that, at least in my process, I think it out a lot. Um, I don't do maquettes, they're an improvisation. Um, I might do a quick doodle, I always am doodling, and they are these, this language, these, this vocabulary that I come back to all the time. And so, um, no, I don't, I don't block it out, but I'm, I'm always thinking about the next step, because it is an improvisation, and it is sort of working in the blind in a way. Um, I mean, I know I knew what I wanted them to do in the end, um, but you know, a lot of it was figured out in contemplation, really. And then, um, and I think that's a big part of my process. So, 
I think that's what he meant when he was saying artists are the laziest people on the planet. I think we have, I know I need a lot of downtime and I have since childhood. I, my mom used to excuse me from going to school because I needed just time out. And the deal was just stay in the house. I couldn't be seen in public. Um, I, it was sort of like my brain would get too hot and I'd have to have Interesting though, because it's a personal discovery. <clears throat> it's not coming from anything that's always been before. No, I mean... I feel like that. I know I, that. I mean, I, I'll say it, and it'll sound like a braggart, but I've always considered my work kind of like world class. And what I mean by that is, you know, I've studied the hell out of art history, you know, and we become acquainted with all these titans. And, um, and really, there are very few, actually, compared to all the plethora of other artists out there. But, you know, so we have this conversation going on in our heads, or at least I do, and you meet these people and you see their work. And I think it was important for me to, I mean, why study all that if you're not somehow connected to it and part of the conversation? And so for me, um, you know, people are always bringing up Elizabeth Murray and Frank Stella. and. Um, um, and as a child, I think I remember I was about three, I saw a Frank Stella exhibit at the Guggenheim and I just have always loved color. You know, I was kind of a gog at that and I didn't realize that till much later on as I was becoming an artist, you know, to make that connection, which was mm -hmm. something so basic to who I am, but, you know, didn't really equate it to my work. Um, so, um, there goes that train of thought again. Well, oh, the, it's you know, this clear idea that of. You, you, yeah, so are, I, I, you are discovering a whole new way. Yeah, it's and Cal nothing, Calder was People another. don't say um, so and so is like Roger right now. But the, the whole point is you have made a breakthrough. And I've noticed because I've been showing art here, but I'm also an artist. And I really agree with you about this idea of seeing a lot of it. There was one time in my life when I went every month during the winter to see things because I was also teaching in New York and I would come home full of these ideas. Lately, I go to maybe three things and I stay longer and I try to get inside that work and it takes maturity. In the beginning, we're all a little derivative. We can't help it. But I was going to mimic the world. You know, these other people didn't either, the people well, that you admire. And It was funny, in grad school someone said, oh, you know, Elizabeth Murray, you know, came up and I didn't know who she was. And, that um, happens. <laughs> and I, and I, I went to the State Museum over in Raleigh and there was an Elizabeth Murray piece there. I think it was in, near, in the entryway and it looked like a painted rock. It, and it was really homely. It was these ugly greens and reds and browns, kind of muddy. And I thought, huh? I Elizabeth don't Murray? Do <laughs> no, I mean, so I just kind of blew her off. And, um, and so, Actually, it was just a number of years ago I was looking at her, you know, she had since died and there was documentaries and I, and I really enjoyed some of her work, but what I, um, uh, oh, sorry, I'm just tired, I think. He worked for three solid days. <clears throat> um, oh, longer than that. Yeah, I know, but three in the, <laughs> three in the sun yeah. all winter, um, every day. Oh, oh, I knew what it was. So. When I got out of graduate school, I was, I was trying to break away from a rectangle because a rectangle just didn't describe my life or, you know, life isn't just a rectangle. So I, I saw her, recently I saw, so I started racking the canvases out of square. And so much of my life as a carpenter was about plumb and square, you know. So I was cobbing together these canvases that were irregular shapes um, and, um, a few years ago, I saw some this period in her life, and it was actually in 95, 6, I think, when I was just getting out of graduate school. She did the same thing. And I was like, I didn't see that. But we were obviously had an, experiencing something in a very similar way, searching for something. Um, so people were right about Elizabeth Murray. I just didn't see you the didn't right get piece. It that way. And it was probably just as well, you know, because at some point in grad school, I was criticized for sort of, like they thought I'd finished a few months early because <laughs> I, it wasn't that I stopped working, but I sort of stopped listening and um, I just was on a mission and what it was is I wanted to find 
my voice because I, through jazz actually, I understood what made somebody's work exceptional was that they were true to their voice. They discovered that. And so I worked furiously to try to connect up what was going on inside with the end of the brush. And there was this moment I was working on, on a, a painting, it was a raw side of beef, a uh, very expressionist piece. And we were, we had given this classic homework assignment, a copy of painting. Uh, Kokoschka, I think it was. Soutine, no, well, I think it was Kokoschka. Yeah, well, maybe anyway, it was Soutine. I think it was Soutine. And so I, the only way to get the coagulated blood was to start slapping my brush on the canvas. And all of a sudden, it was like Harry Potter with the, that thing he does. Zzz, it went zzz. <laughs> And then there I was. I'd arrived. I kind of got what it took to have that connection. And, you know, kind of never looked back. So um, I think that, too, separates me from some because I am just pursuing and expressing my inner voice um, and it really at some point you know then you're, you're sort of on a trajectory there are relationships that you still have with the, the history of art and other artists but you're you know, you're kind of on your own path you know, it's like Ella Fitzgerald's not singing like Billie Holiday same tune maybe but a whole different expression Another funny thing that happened, and it was Wally Barker. Um, my last painting in graduate school was non-objective. It was this totally abstract piece. And I was a little embarrassed about it because I had not ever done anything like that. And um, what happened was I was intrigued with um, uh, window sash, partly because I used to make it by hand as a cabinet maker and carpenter. Um, and it's a sort of a metaphor in art, looking through windows, you know, time, different present, past, future. And I thought, well, why does it have to be a rectangle? And I just started making these circles and it felt so good. <laughs> and, and then, you know, this painting developed. It was quite large, um, you know, human scale. And uh, Wally Barker walked, came to visit. And I started, my paintings had been kind of snippets. I was working with imagination, you know, like remembering. And it had snippets of this and that. And they tended to be studio objects, landscape, mountains, and people. The drawings oftentimes started out as a, a drawing and paint of people in conversation. So I started telling them that the painting was about studio objects, landscape, and um, what was the other one? Oh, and, and people and, and conversation. And um, he stopped me right there and he said, let me tell you a story. It was about the artists at the turn of the 20th century or 19th. Yeah, the 20th century, the early 1900s, sitting around at a cafe in Paris. And these um, codgers were talking about their work. And one of them said, yeah, my paintings are about, you know, landscape elements and studio objects and people in conversation. And, you know, he got up after a while. They had been drinking wine and breaking bread. And, and the others looked at each other and said, he's full of shit. His paintings are about color, light, and paint. And Wally well, said to me, and now that you've done that, you'll never go back. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that put me at ease and I, you know, could feel excited about what I'd just accomplished and he was right, you know, there was no going back. So, and that, I think I've said everything I have to say. Unless you're, yeah. Well, thanks, thanks for taking yeah, the time. That, you were good. I liked it. <laughs> that, that, it flowed well, really well. well but you know, it, it, it's also a good thing to have done, Roger to have said that much. Because at a certain point, a body of work, your life, what you're doing right now, <clears throat> it, it helps to, not just you to focus, but anybody who hears this can get ideas too. Oh, look yeah, I mean, I mean, I it, love it. it can encourage others, you know, because I think we spend so much time practicing skills. And at some point, like you, you hear a professional, usually it's through music you hear people talk. I don't know if, painters are a little more private or something but they'll say you know you have to learn some, some famous composer I, I used to listen always to National Public Radio and the interviews with, and the composer someone was saying a composer I mean a, a pianist was saying he had asked his his it might have been Arthur Rubenstein he said well, how come I have to learn all these classic pieces and he said well because that's sort of the you know 
that's the meal being served at the dinner table. You know, this is the, the creme de la creme of, of piano. But once you've learned it all, you have to forget it and just move on, you know, and that, that's, um, I think that struck me. So at some point, you know, it's not for everybody. Some people will continue to use those skills in a classic way. And then others, I, I always say there's explorers and non-explorers, and I happen to be an explorer. And so to keep my mind engaged, I have to keep moving forward. Way to be. Yeah. I think other people learn from seeing your work too and I think that matters a lot. Yeah, yeah it's part of that continuing conversation. Yeah. yeah. And that's what happens here which I like. Yeah. There's a connection now. In, in this particular show, even <coughs> some of the people who don't know each other have at least seen each other's work and I really like that. Speaking of canons and oh, what are the facts? that are already asserted, what's right, what's wrong. It's always in flux, people mm -hmm. are changing. And the people around you as writers and poets, and well, everything we do has to learn from those things. We make little leaps. Yeah. And you notice that about other people, don't you? <coughs> so. I recommend highly that you go to all three Sculpture Fest 2019.